technical difficulties.
welcome colleagues and members of the public to Health and Wellbeing Board for September. Um, just a point of context in terms of the meeting today, we are streaming on Teams. Um, we had some issues with Skype, which was used last time. So um, unfortunately, um, sometimes the technology doesn't work all of the time, but we're hoping today will be a success. So please bear with us. In order to keep the meeting um, running smoothly, can I ask that if you're not talking, you keep your microphone on mute and also turn the video off, please, because that does help the bandwidth for, um, for the meeting. Um, you can ask a question either by putting a hand up if you have that function or indeed um, put something in the chat box and that will be picked up, hopefully, and directed to me and we can take that forward. So um, without further ado, as I said, welcome everybody. I'm planning just to go around the virtual room now and ask people to introduce themselves, those members that are on the call, and also there, there will be some participants um, uh, around the, uh, the table as well at this point in time, but others will be joining us. So um, I'm Dr. Adam Shepherd. I'm a GP, I'm Chair of Wakefield CCG, and I'm Deputy Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Unfortunately, Councillor Faith Heptonstall cannot be with us today, so she will be sending her apologies. So next I've got Andrew Balchin. Hello, I'm Andrew Balchin. I'm the Corporate Director for Adults and Health in Wakefield Council. Anthony Sadler. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Anthony Sadler, the Service Director for Communities within Wakefield Council, and I'm just here for um, one of the items on item eight. Esther Ashman. Hi, I'm Esther Ashman. I'm the Program Director for Commissioning Futures, and I'm uh, here supporting the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Beate Wagner. Hi, I'm Beata Wagner. I'm the Corporate Director for Children and Young People, Wakefield Council. Thank you, Beata. Dominic Bladen. Hello, I'm uh, Dominic Bladen. I'm the Associate Director for Primary Care and Integration in the Clinical Commissioning Group. Thank you, Dominic. Susanna Cookson. Hello everybody, I'm Susanna Cookson, I'm the Chief Nurse at Wakefield CCG and come here representing clinical um, uh, directors. Thank you. Matt England. Hi, I'm Matt England, Associate Director of Planning and Partnerships for Mid Yorkshire Hospitals Trust and I'm deputising for Martin Barclay, Chief Exec today. Thank you, Matt. Charlotte Freeman. Hello, um, I'm here actually as a, a researcher who's doing a piece of research for Sheffield Hallam University and Leeds Beckett University. We're just observing the use of research across Wakefield Council. So I'm I'm kind of here just as an observer, really. Welcome, Charlotte. Uh, Thank Jim you. Gamble. Good afternoon, Gemma Gamble, Strategy and Partnership Manager for Wakefield CCG, and I'll be assisting with the um, board this afternoon. Thank you, Gemma. Gary Jevon. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Jevon. I'm the Chief Executive of Health Watch Wakefield. Thank you. Debbie Hallett. Hi, I'm Debbie Hallett. I'm a GP and Wakefield CCG Governing Body Member. Thank you, Debbie. Anna Hartley. Hello, I'm Anna Hartley. I'm the Director of Public Health. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Kate Hurst. I think Kate is directing our streaming, actually, so I'll introduce her. She may have uh, uh, her, her, her video and microphone off. Um, Catherine McGowan. Hi, Catherine McGowan, Committee Officer for Wakefield Council. Thank you. Mark McManus. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Mark McManus, um, Chief Superintendent, District Commander, Wakefield Police. Thank you, Mark. Sean Rayner. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Sean Rayner, I'm Director of Provider Development and South West Yorkshire Partnerships Trust. And for item eight, um, I'll be presenting in capacity as chair of the Wakefield Mental Health Alliance. Thank you, Sean, and welcome. Richard Forster. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councillor Richard Forster. I'm Deputy Portfolio Holder for Children and Young People. Thank you, Richard. Sarah Roxby. 
Hello everyone, Sarah Roxby, Wakefield District Housing Service Director for Health and Wellbeing. Thank you. Stephen Hardy. Hi everyone, uh, Stephen Hardy, Lane Member for Public Engagement at Wakefield CCG. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, as I said, welcome everybody. I do have apologies from Meryn McRae, Joe Webster, Mel Brown, Linda Harris and Martin Barkley. Matt England obviously is attending for Martin in his absence and apologies from Lee Miller. Any other apologies, please? Okay, thank you. Moving on to the minutes of the meeting of the 9th of July. Are we happy they are a true record? those that were present during that meeting. I will take silence as agreement. Just want to draw, I'm not prepared to go through the whole section of the minutes, but there's uh, two or three things I just want to draw attention to. On page two, the public question, there has been a written response sent to that member of the public, and that's been provided by the board. Um, page five, Esther, I believe you have circulated the plans on a page for the successful bids for the health uh, inequalities transformation monies. Is that correct? It is. Yes, they've gone out. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I think I've seen those those today. And um, you'll note any actions from the presentations from the last meeting have been captured in the action log, which is on the agenda and will move forward shortly. So um, any comments on the minutes or matters arising or any other business that I need to know now to add into the meeting? Everybody happy? Okay. Esther's got a hand up, Chair. Oh, sorry, I'm not seeing that. Sorry, who's got a hand up? It's it's, it's myself, Chair Esther. Um, just just on the back of the minutes from last time, and there was an update from um, each of the the sectors. And uh, just to say that I think Matt England has just a very brief update at some point on the agenda from um, the the acute hospital trust. Okay, so. Um, we might want to take that. Sorry, Matt, are you taking that then? Yeah, in terms of a, a COVID update from the trust. Right, okay. Well, perhaps take that at the end of the agenda, if that's okay. Um, we'll try and build that in. Okay, thank you. Right, so without further ado, we'll move on. Um, this is a different style of meeting, as I've said. Um, we are streaming, so if there are problems with streaming, we'll be asked to pause the meeting because we're a meeting in public. So I ask you to bear with us if that does happen. Um, as you know, we're in difficult times um, and who knows what's in store for us as a population um, in Wakefield over the next six months. Um, just want to express my sadness and condolences to those that have uh, lost loved ones through COVID and also those that are going through fairly difficult rehabilitation in some circumstances and this can be very challenging at times. As always I want to thank um, you and your teams as leaders for steering us through this very difficult time and also a time where we're trying to reset services to get back to some form of business as usual whatever that might look like. So thank you very much and I wish you as leaders uh, to extend our thanks back into the team particularly with a view to um, the emphasis today that we're going to be looking at um, our vulnerable communities and the work that people on the ground are doing to support these communities at this present time. Really important stuff. I think from my perspective as a GP, I see it from all aspects. Certainly in my clinical leadership role, I see the strategic challenges of a challenge system, but working together, we're succeeding. But when I sit in my surgery, I see an awful lot of concerns around social isolation, issues around mental health, emotional well-being. And I've got great concerns going forward that we need to protect the most vulnerable. And we'll hear about how we're doing some of that today. So I ask all of you to consider those nearest to us and also reach out to the public, friends and family to support them going forward. And I'm sure you will. Um, also want to raise awareness of having the flu vaccination. It's more important than ever this year that we get the flu campaign correct. And I'd like you to encourage both yourselves to take up the flu vaccinations and encourage others to do so, and certainly those vulnerable groups. Finally, I just want to mention, and I'm sure you all know this, that Meryn McRae is leaving the council at the end of this month. And she was a great advocate for health and well-being. Uh, in this district and I'm sure you'll echo my sentiment that she's been a great asset in Wakefield and I 
hope you all wish her well in the future. And uh, thank you for her help. Okay, so moving on, public questions. There are no public questions that have been submitted. So without further ado, we will move on to the action log. Esther. Thank you, Chair. So um, we didn't include the action log in the last meeting because I think things had, it was a, a bit of an unusual meeting that we had last time and was at quite short notice. But we want to start to get back into the rhythm of having a, a log which not only describes um, the things that we want to take forward as a board, but also some of the successes and will help inform some of our annual reports and, and strategies going forward. Um, for the, in the uh, it, it, basically, because of time, I don't want to go through every single action, but you will have seen that we took on board the comments from earlier this year in regards to the style of the log. And we have also closed down quite a number of the actions that, that have happened over the last few months. Um, so I want to pick a few out, but also just to, to make a note really for everyone that we have had a period of disruption for a number of months. And so whilst everybody around the table has been trying their best to respond to COVID, COVID, that some of the things that were on the action log and that as a board we've chosen to take forward may well have paused in that time. So just to note that, that that doesn't mean to say these things won't be picked up, but there might be just a slight delay in how they're done as, as people are, are undertaking other duties. Um, so there are a couple of things outstanding which I know are being worked on. Um, so uh, last November we had a discussion around uh, data on referrals and um, those who have been admitted to hospital for self-harm and making sure that those links to specialist support are, are being undertaken and I know Matt's working closely with the public health team on that um, I'd, I, and if at the end Matt if there's anything you want to add in please do feel free to but I think that's just one of those things that's in progress um, at the moment. There is also um, a, in terms of the uh, I think it's number 42, where the board would consider the opportunity to link the skills of adults who are socially isolated with young people who may need additional support. Again, this is one that's perhaps paused slightly because of COVID, but certainly the approach has been um, agreed and that would be through the National Citizenship Service. So the plan is, um, is, is in place as to how to do that. And I'm sure uh, an update will come back to, to the board at a future date. Similarly, the risk and resilience program and linking that into primary care home networks I understand Emily Castle from Young Lives Consortium is, is working something up to uh, present to the primary care networks. So again, that is underway, although slightly delayed at the moment. Um, the Healthy Schools Programme, uh, that was agreed that it would either be considered as a future board meeting or under one of the subgroups, but that's not um, expected to, to be completed until later this year. And then there were a number of actions from um, January, which were tied up around the presentation that Tom Stannard gave, which then rolled into July. And July, we had a number of actions, all of which have been completed, I'm, I'm really pleased to say. So one of which um, the chair has already mentioned, which is in terms of plans on a page for successful transformation funding bids um, related to Wakefield. That has been shared with everybody now. The connectivity um, between primary care and shielding and social prescribing and the work on carers. I understand that carers Wakefield have now presented their work to the primary care networks clinical directors meeting so that they could try and identify opportunities for, for that connectivity and to build that into the ICP work streams. Um, and then there was a, a quite a meaty discussion that was had with Linda Harrison and Tom Stannard, um, which was really helpful. And uh, earlier this week, a presentation was given to the Integrated Care Partnership as, as discussed. Um, and I know that there is some significant work work happening in this program, uh, not least a joint post to facilitate the next stage of the work. So whilst that has been completed, it would be helpful to have an update at some point in the future on that, I think. Um, so those are the, the actions to date, unless anyone wants to pick up on their individual actions with any additional information. Thank you very much, Esther. Any comments or questions relating related to the action log? Unfortunately, I cannot see hands up on my screen so it can be guided by others if anybody's got any questions I, I don't think we've got any hands up as yet right okay well we'll move on then and accept that uh, that action log thank thank you very much i did admit to um urge members uh, obviously to declare any interests in, within the meeting obviously if any becomes apparent please let me know as chair as the meeting moves forward 
Um, urgent items. There aren't any urgent items. Um, however, I just wonder on reflection, we have got a couple of minutes. If we just let Matt come in now for a COVID update, um, in, in particular with, with relationship to the trust, Matt, and then um, we can move into our four presentations and the, the core part of the agenda. So over to you, Matt. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so uh, we have recently been uh, undertaking our plans around um, increasing activity back up to pre-COVID levels, and we've got plans in place to be compliant with the NHS England, NHS improvement uh, expectations of activity being back up to 90%. Key risk around this at the moment is um, availability of workforce due to the uh, test and trace, uh, and also potential risk around the levels of non-elective activity that um, we've been seeing in the trust. The emergency department activity is pretty much back up to the sort of pre-COVID levels, and obviously that's a concern given the sort of high numbers of patients that are coming in with conditions that might not require an A&E department. And that does create some uh, potential risk around crowding uh, within the A&E department and uh, around social distancing. So we have released a video that's on social media and uh, so it's on YouTube and I think you can access it through our website as well, uh, which is to try and support the public in terms of uh, decision making about coming to A&E uh, and to obviously to just come to A&E when it's for uh, emergency reasons. Um, we are see, starting to see some increases in COVID admissions in line with elsewhere within the country as well. Um, but yeah, I would urge people to kind of have a look at that video and uh, that will give some indications on how to use A&E. And that was it from me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Matt. Any questions or comments for Matt? I think just to echo um, Matt's points there, certainly from a primary care general practice perspective, the whole system is busy. Um, there are concerns that um, uh, we are going to deal with a difficult winter, uh, hence the need for people to get immunized against flu. We are facing a COVID spike and we're trying to reset the system and maintain a healthy population considering other illnesses apart from COVID. Um, the system is doing a really good job um, and I feel that as leaders, there's a real grip in, in the system. And um, we will keep you informed. Um, we would ask um, people to consider how best to access services uh, in the light of the pressures. But please be assured that certainly from a general practice perspective, um, we're open as normal. Um, people may be dealt with in a different way, but they will be dealt with. So please don't stay away, certainly if there are urgent needs. Um, and I think that's really all I wanted to say on that one. Okay, um, Sean, did you want to come in? I can see your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it, it may be that I'm not as close to the to the detail, and therefore this is a question through ignorance. But uh, just on what Matt was saying there about ED attendances, is there something more proactive we need to be doing about um, the publicity around that and? Um, the social media options of alternative um, uh, options that are available to the public. Uh, I'm thinking from a mental health context, for example, Matt, uh, is, do we need to be doing more proactively on that, I guess, is my question. Yeah, just before Matt comes back in, I think um, Sean and most others would be aware of the 111 first um, sort of uh, situation where we're using 111 for clinical assessments and directing patients and public to the right place it's appropriate for them it's not about putting barriers up it's just actually getting to the right place first time so um watch this space certainly around 111 but i share concerns about the use of a and e and um we need to make sure that, that is appropriate so um matt i don't want you don't know if you want to come back in on that one yeah i mean i was going to echo your point uh, adam about the uh, 111 first um i think you know definitely in terms of um the social media and promotion of of the sort of message that um you know a and e is open for emergencies but we you know um where it's not an emergency you know for people to look at what the alternatives are um that would be yeah i think that would be very positive to a uh, message to promote uh, from partners Okay, thank you, Matt. Any questions or comments uh, for Matt or on anything that we've just discussed? 
Okay. Thank you very much. Right. We will now, I think we're just about on time. So we'll now move on to the major part of the agenda, which is the focused discussion on reducing health inequalities um, in the Wakefield health and care system. And as you know, this is one of our main priorities for the health and wellbeing plan. And we've got a series of um, four very exciting presentations, which we're going to hear about in due course. And I think this is in particular within the context of COVID and particularly around our most vulnerable communities and populations and actually what we're doing to try and assist that and reduce those inequalities that we all see in practice and certainly I see in clinical practice. Um, just to set the scene, I'm going to hand over to Esther, who um, is going to play us a very nice little video. I have seen this before, and it's certainly worth a watch, and I think it brings a number of issues home. So, Esther, before we move into the four presentations, do you want to take over and play that video for, for everyone? I, I will do. Thank you, Chair. And apologies for those of you who, who have seen it before, but I think it's really worth uh, a watch again. And it frames the discussions today around health inequalities really nicely. This is a video that's been um, developed by the Improving Population Health Programme for the West Yorkshire and Harrogate um, Health and Care Partnership. But it's been very much developed with young people and with young young people's voices, which really does have quite an impact. I'm sure you'll agree when you've, when you've seen the video. So if you could just bear with me, moment and I will um, try and share my screen so that you can see that. Oh, just bear with me a moment. you agree that that's a really powerful animation that's being created and, and will hopefully give you some real food for thought when you hear the presentations that you're going to hear today. So Chair, if I can hand back over you, over to you for the presentations. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, an excellent video, certainly touched me uh, watching that for the first time and I want Wakefield to be that place and I think the impact and the voices of young people in that is extremely strong. So thank you very much for that. So. We will now move into our first presentation, which is agenda item 8A. And this is around preventing ill health as a priority, reducing health inequalities again, um, within our uh, vulnerable groups. And as people will be aware, this priority is led by the Integrated Care Partnership Board. And Mel Brown, who um, is currently on leave, I'm sure would love to have been present uh, for this um, presentation. Um, however, I'm going to introduce Dominic Bladen, um, who works with Mel, to provide an update in this area. Uh, Dominic, uh, I think you've already introduced yourself, but you may want to just do that once again. So over to you, Dominic. 
Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, I'm Dominic Bladen. I'm the Associate Director of Primary Care and Integration at the CCG. And what I'm going to try and do now is just describe some of the work that is currently underway to support vulnerable groups in Wakefield. And it's uh, it's interesting watching that video because what one of the things that really I've noticed over the last few months is the solidarity that there is around you know, supporting these groups and making sure that we have the right kind of networks and the support in place and we get and we try and help people through COVID as best we can as we're going as we're going through this winter. Um, so there's been some great partnership work going on. Hopefully that's illustrated in, in this presentation. Uh, it also looks at how we've been trying to reduce health inequalities within these within these groups. As Adam said, that the Integrated Care Partnership has identified a number of priorities coming out of COVID, and one of these is to provide support to vulnerable people and those who are shielded. And, and that priority is led by myself, Susanna Cookson, and Anthony Sadler from the local authority. Uh, as part of this, we've identified a range of groups of people that have been affected by COVID, um, and we've looked. We've identified leads or champions for each of those cohorts. Uh, and we're working with them to ensure that services and support are in place uh, as we leave lockdown and we get things back to normal as, as, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, next slide. So as part of the work we have done on this priority, we've uh, coordinated, an, we started by coordinating an audit which, which tried to give us a picture of the impact of lockdown on the on the groups that we've just that I've just been talking about and what over all of the groups we found some kind of general themes first of all first of all is uh, there is evidence of widening inequalities within vulnerable group, groups locally both economically and in health terms which we need to address there is support to address those widening inequalities but it is limited and uh, and there is a concern that those inequalities are are becoming more acute as we go through COVID. Uh, there are mechanisms in place uh, to engage with service users within each of the vulnerable groups you've identified, which is good. So we can check with them uh, how they're kind of experiencing uh, the health service currently. Uh, partners have uh, redeployed staff from business as usual services to support to t focus on people who are high risk, which has been great whilst we've been in COVID. But as we're going back into day-to-day -day services, there's a danger that support will be withdrawn. So we're kind of mindful of that. Uh, there's evidence of very good support for people who are shielded. I think that the local authority, Anthony and, and partners have done a great job in uh, providing the necessary support for that group. There is evidence of mental health impact across all the cohorts that I'll be talking about today, clearly. That's, uh, I think everybody's mental health will have been impacted, but particularly these types of groups who tend to be more isolated are going to, are going to struggle. Uh, but there's also behind that found some great evidence of partnership working evolving from the audit, showing how uh, partner organisations have really uh, put aside differences, uh, put aside policy and legal framework differences and cultural differences and, and really worked hard together to try and support vulnerable groups, which has been great to see. Next slide. So just identifying some more key themes really. Um, and, and what we've tried to do now is what are, what are we try, gonna try and address for each of the uh, vulnerable groups that we have identified? First of all, key area is trying to support, you know, address the emerging mental health needs for all the vulnerable groups that we're working with. We think that's that is a, there's a potential kind of avalanche of, of mental health support that we're going to have to provide and there's, there's going to be a resource implications around that. Uh, the re-establishment of day-to-day -day services, so making sure that we target those services that are specifically for people who are vulnerable and get those in place as soon as possible. Uh, We've uh, now got a, a new group of vulnerable people who are those who have already, who've had COVID-19 and are going to have uh, residual impacts as a result of that. So they're going to have long COVID, they're going to have, uh, they're going to be coming, they're going to have lost somebody with COVID. So how do we support people as we are, as we are, how do we support those people who've been directly affected uh, by, by COVID? Supporting people who are shielded. So there's been a lot of, Anthony will, uh, may want to chip in at some point with this, but there's a lot of people who 
have been receiving a lot of support and then we're now withdrawing services from them and we're withdrawing support at a time when they still are probably very vulnerable. So we're mindful of making sure that we try and maintain as much support for them as we possibly can. There's a big issue around workforce recovery and realignment within, say, the care sector, within care homes, within some of the services that, that are supporting these vulnerable groups which need to be addressed. And then finally, there's, there's the whole issue of addressing health inequalities uh, that are starting to emerge as a, result of, uh, as a result of COVID. So those are the key themes across the vulnerable groups. So what I thought I'd do now is just give you a bit of a picture of what is going on uh, within each of the uh, within, within each of the cohorts that we are currently working with. This is not uh, uh, comprehensive. It's not ev not every rural group is represented here, but I just thought it might be helpful to highlight uh, some of the stuff that's that's, that's going on. Uh, so on, on adult social care, for example, we're now starting to see adult daycare services reopening. Uh, where safe and appropriate, which is which is is starting to reach out to people who've been so socially isolated, the discharge to assess processes from hospital are being have been reviewed in line with national guidance, and we are starting to and, we, and we're trying to put in place a robust discharge to assess a set of arrangements for as we come into winter. Uh, as part of that, there's a community we're trying to commission beds in the community, which can be used for hospital discharge. Uh, which will free up the hospital wards, but also it means that people can be assessed in the community and people can get the appropriate support and not be discharged into a care home if they've got COVID, which is incredibly important. On mental health, uh, Paul Howitson is, is well underway uh, with uh, a lot of work on restart services, including the uh, memory clinic referrals and uh, severe mental illness health checks, uh, supporting the development of a safe space for Wakefield District, which will divert people away from A&E so that they can be supported in the community. And then the restart of, uh, of autism assessments as well, he's been looking at that. On learning disabilities, we've got a tactical group in place to consider the needs of people with learning disabilities as we're coming out of COVID. Uh, there's advocacy support groups have been specifically funded to seek the views of those with learning disabilities to try and establish what the impact has been on them during lockdown and how we might be able to support them as we as we move out of that uh, and uh, arrangements have been put in place for restarting learning disability annual health checks through primary care um, in relation to people who are shielded um, so there's been obviously as i said before some great use of um, so there's been some great support going into that particular cohort. Uh, we've, there's been an imaginative use of community hubs, uh, distribution of food parcels, support with prescriptions, deliveries and mental health support. The social prescribing service was realigned to be able to support that particular group. Um, however, it is now critical that we don't forget that group. There is, There are potentially going to be local lockdowns. There will continue to be a lot of anxiety and uncertainty amongst that group and there will be an economic impact as well that we need to take into account so we haven't forgotten even though the shielding lists have been shut down we haven't forgotten those people who are who are particularly vulnerable people who with chronic health conditions who have been unable to access primary care for example and get the, the kind of regular support they would normally get so general practice has restarted the reviews for people on chronic disease registers, and they're well ahead of that, actually. They are, there's a high proportion of people who have been reviewed within the last year, which we've recently been doing some work around. Um, we've got general practice, as Adam said, starting to open up, doing face-to-face -face work with people who have chronic disease, diseases. Uh, there's also targeted support for people in care homes being put in place as part of a multidisciplinary team. And the social prescribing service is now starting to work with people with long-term conditions and, 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 and working with them to get them back into the community and, and to get them engaged back into uh, community-type activities. Um, on maternity, the, uh, the local maternity system is, is coordinating work across the region on reaching out to BAME communities and the local maternity services are starting to offer more face-to-face -face support. On housing needs and homelessness, uh, the main the main focus on homelessness has been as over the last three months has been to try and find alternative accommodation for people who were 
house in hotels, which are now starting to open up. <clears throat> the local authority has recently been successful in obtaining a, a £350,000 grant to fund to support homeless people alongside health partners, which has been great. There's also a lot of work being done on opening up the independent living schemes, getting a lot more face-to-face -face work in there. The community alarm service as well, getting that restarted. So we've been engaging with people like Sarah uh, on issues like that. And then substance misuse services are starting to uh, get going again with face-to-face -face appointments uh, uh, beginning to get beginning to start. So you can so that hopefully gives you a sense of the types of work that are going on, the way in which we are trying to organise that work, the way that we're trying to get assurance uh, in these areas, and that's being reported through to the uh, integrated care partnership so that they're visible. They, we've got some visibility around that. Um, as I said, there's a huge amount of effort going up, going into restarting services and preventing the widening of health inequalities within that group. There are still significant challenges, but it has been, but there's been, there has been some fantastic work being done. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, great presentation there. An awful lot of work is going on. Obviously, um, I sit on um, Integrated Care Partnership and um, it's responsible for leading and delivering some of this that you've heard about. Um, today we're asked to, to note the content in the paper and I want to stimulate a discussion please in terms of any opportunity to support the work further. So uh, I'm just looking in terms of hands. Uh, any questions or comments for Dominic please? Sean. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you. I it's something that we've perhaps touched on before, the Health and Wellbeing Board, but um, th there's clearly a lot of activity there in a very positive direction. I just wonder whether there's some underpinning approach about making every contact count. Um, amongst all our organisations, we employ a lot of uh, staff in Wakefield who come to, into contact with um, vulnerable groups on a daily basis and whether there's something we can do to make sure those staff are supported to provide consistent approaches in terms of ensuring that um, service offers are well known and people are supported to making ensuring access to the right services and, and enabling our staff to to be cognizant of um, what those service offers are and make, making those contacts count every opportunity. Yeah, I'd certainly agree with you there, Sean. I think never before it's been so important for organisations to work together as a whole, as, as one team in Wakefield. Um, I've got real concerns about low-level mental health and um, people fearing that they cannot access services. And certainly in my work as a GP, I, I, um, you know, I find I'm supporting people um, and signposting there. Um, my other concern, obviously, is around um, technology and the fact that technology appears to be everywhere at the moment, even to checking into venues and, you know, talk to people through video consultations and telephones. And there are those that cannot use these media. And, and I just I just worry about, you know, are we doing enough to support those individuals uh, in various parts of the system? Um, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies if any colleagues were before me in the, the list of hands up. Um, it was really just to say that uh, um, thank you to Dominic for the, the, the summary there of all the activity that's gone on. Um, and just to add that I think in addition to a lot of that support that's been provided from a number of the agencies around the table today, that local communities and voluntary and community sector organisations have played a huge part um, over recent months and we've seen I think some really strong responses from community groups emerging um, and one of the things that I hope we can continue to support and capture is that enthusiasm and that local passion and that local inventiveness um, and that capturing that for the future is going to be an important uh, challenge for our whole system um, and some of that might need to be thought about in terms of future funding that we provide to voluntary and community sector organisations because um, a lot of the activity doesn't need a lot of funding but it needs to be sustained so I think um, my final point would be for us as a partnership to think about how voluntary and community sector organisations 
um, are enabled to join the future debate about how we tackle health inequalities. Thank you. Did you want to come back in on that, Dominic? Uh, I can come back at the end if you want. Okay, no, that's absolutely fine. Susanna. Hello. Um, yes, just to say, I think that both of those points from Andrew or Sean are really um, valid and particularly around making every contact count. And what we're really keen to do within this programme is really use the digital, as you've already said, but also the workforce as an enabler to make sure that we get that connectivity from all organisations in and making sure we've got the workforce um, training right to help support um, everyone, every every contact matters and every contact counts approach. So we are very much connected with Linda's PMO work as well. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Susanna, it's um, it's great to see the voluntary sector involved in much of this because, of course, this encourages communities and populations to embed some of this work, and that, in my world, you know, surrounds our primary care networks and our GP practices that are leading some of this work with various other organisations across Wakefield. So, I welcome that, Dominic. Yeah, just picking up on those three points. First of all, I think Sean makes a good point about every making every contact count for two reasons. First of all, it's better coordination, more efficient way of actually supporting people at the moment by trying to streamline the support that's going in. But especially in these days of limited face-to-face -face contact, it would be useful if we could kind of work with each other to try and limit the amount of direct contact we have with people who are vulnerable. Um, the, uh, the issue about technology as well, Adam, that you, wrote, that you raised is a really good one. I mean, we're working in this virtual world now, which is which none of us are particularly used to, but it's got some fantastic advantages. The, the, the other issue with it, though, is that it is, there's a potential for social isolation. We just purely rely on virtual consultation, so we just need to be mindful of that. And then finally, I'm glad Andrew raised the issue of community groups and the third sector, which I should have uh, focused on because the community sector has been absolutely fantastic in supporting vulnerable people over the last six months. Uh, and we really should learn that we need to try and develop that sector, over, uh, not just as, as we're going through the winter, beyond that. We can see the kind of additionality that they provide, how they can support the statutory sector in, uh, in making sure that vulnerable groups are protected. So absolutely, we need to try and, uh, and highlight that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, any further questions or comments? Okay, so we were just asked to note the content of the paper and obviously have um, some debate around this. And I welcome further updates. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll move on. Okay. Item 8B, healthy standard of living for all, impact on local economy and poverty in the district. Really important in the context of COVID. Um, we all know the effects um, nationally on the economy, indeed globally, and certainly around local uh, Wakefield economy, and it's linked to poverty, which is really important, also links into our vulnerable groups. Um, so I'd like to introduce Claire Elliott and Mike Denby, who have joined us um, to take us through this presentation. Um, Claire and Mike, would you like to introduce yourself and your role uh, as you move forward? And over to you. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for having us. This is an honour. This is my first ever health and wellbeing board meeting, I think, uh, which is quite surprising, actually. So I'm Claire Elliott. I'm the service director for economic growth and skills uh, within the regeneration directorate. And that covers everything from the business support functions to uh, strategic housing, adult education and all the physical regen work that we do as a council. Uh, and I think Mike is on the call, hopefully. We're struggling to get on. Are you here, Mike? I am indeed. I've logged on using my mobile phone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Danby. I'm the Skills and Business Service Manager at Wakefield Council. Uh, reporting into Clare, supporting our existing business stock across the district and trying to attract new businesses uh, to Wakefield. So busy time for us at the moment, doing all we can to, uh, to keep businesses trading and uh, productive. I think someone's helpfully doing our slides for us, if, that, if you're OK to move on. Thank you. Okay, move on. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, well, just a quick overview of what we're going to cover. So, 
I'm going to do a bit of a summary of the national economic impact of COVID. I'm sure you're probably all fed up of reading about it, but uh, kind of need to do that to set the context. Then Mike's going to provide some local insight into what this means for Wakefield and to look ahead at some potential scenarios. But again, accepting there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding this at the moment. I'll cover some of what this is likely to mean for the lives of people in Wakefield. And I think you've asked us to particularly focus on what it means for those people that are living in or vulnerable to poverty. Uh, and then I'll outline just some of the actions that we've been taking and will be continuing to take to mitigate uh, some of these risks. And just a caveat in advance that never going to be able to cover everything. And I think we've got about 15 minutes uh, and we cover quite a wide range of services, but we'll be more than happy to come back to any future meetings if there's any particular themes or issues uh, you want us to focus on next time. So in terms of the national impact, again, I'll run through this quickly because I'm sure that everyone's glued to the BBC News website uh, daily on all of this. But you'll be well aware, 23rd of March onwards, unprecedented restrictions. Uh, and interestingly, these restrictions were already starting to affect uh, UK trade and export activity by the end of, by the end of March. So it had a really, really quick uh, impact. So all overwhelmed by the amount of commentary and predictions on what this might mean for the economy. And a lot of the latest forecasts seem to talk about a fall in GDP of around 10% uh, this year and unemployment rising to the same level. So 10% of people of working age being employed. And uh, a lot of predictions saying that that unemployment rate will stay as it is at around 10% for several years. By August, so in March, uh, the, the graph shows how quickly business activity fell from March onwards. By August, it, it was looking a lot more promising. So the ONS reported based on all industries and the, out of the businesses they'd surveyed that 96% were currently trading, which is really quite high. But we know that although 96% might be trading, a significant amount of businesses have taken a really serious hit to their income stream. So 47% of businesses have reported a decrease in turnover compared to what they'd expect at this time of year, but 13% reported an increase. And, and it's important to remember we've got some people that are really really benefiting from this pandemic, not necessarily relishing in the fact, but uh, you know some businesses have been ideally placed to capitalise on the opportunities it's brought. Uh, and the ONS data, latest data in September, showed 36% of the workforce were working remotely nationally. And I just flagged that because it's worth being aware of the impact and the knock-on effect that's then having on hospitality and retail businesses because we're not seeing that footfall in our city and town centres. In terms of worst affected industries, again, you're probably well aware, hospitality, accommodation and food services service industries. 23% uh, of businesses in accommodation and food talking about being at real risk of insolvency. And again, the other really affected industry is arts, entertainment and recreation. So 40% of people within that sector have reported that their operating costs have exceeded uh, the turnover, which is clearly unsustainable. And then I just wanted to also flag the finance uh, squeeze that is being placed on businesses that are haven't stopped trading so that they're still managing to to trade but according to ons around half of them have got invoices owed to them so even if they're managing to still operate there's clearly the impact on the supply chain uh, and that's because of reduced trading high levels of bad debt and a squeeze on uh, on banks lending so although there's been a number of bailout schemes announced by the banks really useful in the short term but clearly it just means that it's leaving smes with, with more debt which could impact on their uh, future resilience so that's kind of national pitch i think mike's going to do a bit now on what this has meant for us locally thanks claire um, there's a number of similarities on a on a local level uh, we're around 95 percent of businesses uh, now trading so uh, in line with the 96 percent on a on a national basis uh, most restrictions as we know are now lifted um, but whilst they're all lifted it's quite a mixed bag uh, locally, with uh, some of the best businesses still only 80% of where they were this time last year. Um, and that's seen as a real positive for, for businesses locally, but there's still some way to go. Um, obviously, there's, there's more worry this week with recent announcements uh, affecting the bottom line of a number of businesses. Um, lots of talk this week 
uh, with businesses we've been dealing with, even just down to um, bars and restaurants now having to provide table service. These are all the things that we're working through to pro- try and provide solutions for, for businesses. And obviously, we still can't forget the events industry and uh, nightclubs and certain you know, late night opening bars that are still yet to open and haven't done since March. Uh, there are some positives out there. The Eat Out to Help Out scheme did provide uh, people with confidence uh, to shop and to to eat out again in the city centres. Uh, and we've had hundreds of v- venues which registered and did benefit from that scheme. Uh, the furlough scheme, um, one in three people were furloughed in Wakefield. Uh, that's 48,000 people uh, that had been registered on the, the furlough scheme. Um, and the unemployment across the, the city region, which is a, a sobering thought, something I sent to Claire earlier this week, uh, is the highest since 1987. Um, there's been some new announcements today on the furlough scheme by the Chancellor, and that's been welcomed by businesses and uh, by us as a local authority, which will now allow businesses a little bit more breathing space to, to bring their um, staff to full-time employment. What that basically means is... Um, Again, similar to what I said earlier, is 80% of um, businesses, the best ones, are only trading to 80% of what they did this time last year. So that will provide them a little bit of breathing space to uh, to bring their staff uh, back full time. Uh, many businesses um, are facing significant debt. Again, there's been some announcements today by the Chancellor, uh, which means that the government, again, will be giving more breathing space to businesses that have taken out certain loan products as a result of the pandemic. Um, government grants um, have provided businesses that breathing space. And I was at a board meeting yesterday for a um, uh, a business yesterday, uh, a charity in, in Wakefield, and they're showing a profit for the first quarter. But I think what we're going to see um, is the impact really hitting um, in the uh, in the, the coming quarters and the back end of the year. So at the minute they, they're showing a profit, but there's going to be a significant deficit um, projected by the end of uh, end of March. Uncertainty remains locally. Uh, the new restrictions uh, announced this week. Uh, and still the uncertainty around the events industry remains, um, along with the rise in internet shopping. Again, he's providing um, uh, a new outlet for, for, for those who, who, who previously wouldn't have shopped online. Um, we've got one example here of, of Burberry, where businesses are being innovative um, during the pandemic. Burberry um, changed their services so they could offer PPE during the pandemic. Um, And that's just one example of a large business that's been really innovative. And that's something that we need to try and stimulate across businesses uh, in the Wakefield district. But that innovation doesn't need to be large scale. Um, Some of the smaller businesses uh, have really been resilient during this time and and, and produce some uh, some great working practices. Looking ahead, uh, you can see from this graphic, this is some work commissioned by uh, Experian. Uh, it looks at three different scenarios uh, based on a V-shaped uh, economic recovery, which is uh, a quick reduction uh, due to the lockdown. Uh, and then you would then see a quick recovery. Uh, we've got a delayed V, which is uh, a gradual recovery as restrictions ease uh, and a speedy recovery. Um, that will then gain more momentum. And then we've got the uh, W-shaped recovery, which this basically reflects a second lockdown, um, presenting that loss in confidence, which then will uh, will increase over time. I think when you look at where we are currently, and this has been um, released since uh, July, I would probably say we're somewhere at the moment in the local economy in between a delay V scenario and a W-shaped uh, scenario recovery. And just to give you a flavour, when you look at unemployment rates, this time last year was around 4%, and we expect it to be around 9% uh, by the end of this year. Uh, And that looks around 10,000 residents which will be unemployed uh, based on projections by the end of uh, of this year. Move on to the next slide. Uh, during this time, since uh, since the, the end of March, uh, we've undertaken 
Uh, a lot of work with businesses. Over 1,800 businesses have been supported uh, since the uh, since the end of March. That's detailed business support that we've been offering uh, offering businesses, uh, such as if when we're speaking with businesses, if they need access to finance, we'll then work with businesses to to access the right uh, finance products for them. Um, interestingly, one in four businesses currently. Uh, uh, a a dealing with um, we're dealing with inquiries through the Wakefield First website, uh, and one in four businesses visited us only last month. Um, since since the end of March as well, we've facilitated the uh, the business grant scheme where we've provided over £70 million worth of grants to over 6,400 businesses, um, and a lot of work. Um, has been uh, has been undertaken to support those businesses. Uh, the one good thing is we've been able to build great relationships with businesses locally, and that will allow us to support businesses in the future, especially should we have any uh, any local lockdowns in the future. Um, we've had to change the way we engage with businesses, uh, and we've. Um, introduced a number of different webinars and remote uh, learning sessions. This month alone, webinars continue and we've got 22 webinars that are available to Wakefield businesses uh, that are delivered uh, this month alone. Um, all on subjects that businesses tell us they need additional support with, so things such as generating customers, attracting more customers via social media, and how they can now network in a virtual environment. Um, and finally, and last but not, not, uh, not least, what we need to do is identify the businesses that are deemed at risk. Uh, you'll have heard from the announcement, some of our key Wakefield employers, such as Haribo, has announced a significant amount of redundancies in recent weeks. Um, and what we're doing is working with businesses that we identify through our business diagnostics to ensure that we can support the businesses and their employees that are deemed at risks. Um, because when we're speaking with other businesses, we're identifying those growing businesses and the vacancies that they've got, the job vacancies, so we can link the uh, those at risk to future job vacancies across the district. And that's Claire, if you want to move yeah. on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so rightly, we need to kind of focus on what all of that actually means for, for people's lives. And I am conscious that uh, Tom recently attended, Tom Stanad, and ran through what we're doing on skills and employment and how that links to your work programme. So I'm only going to touch on it briefly, but it's really quite difficult to talk about what all of that economic impact means for people in poverty without touching uh, on incomes and, and livelihoods, which is what, why skills and employment matters. So, so I think you'll be well aware the JSNA in 2019 showed that 16% of our population, around 54,000 people, live in neighbourhoods that are amongst the 10% most deprived in England. So just a reminder of the, of the challenges we're facing and then that's been further compounded by the fact we've now got an additional 6,500 residents uh, who are needing to claim some kind of benefit compared to back in March. So we've had a 94% increase in residents who are needing to rely on benefits uh, to be able to have uh, uh, appropriate sustainable household income and this is before the job retention scheme has completely come to a close so encouraging uh, news this afternoon for those who haven't seen it in terms of something that's been put in place to partially fill the gap that the uh, furlough scheme will end but we still expect those numbers to continue to rise and probably to rise quite exponentially uh, and we know that our deprivation profile is shaped to a large extent by low skill levels across the district and along with several other wide determinants of health, which I know this board takes a keen interest in. So these low skill levels are inevitably going to make it harder for those who are out of work to find alternative employment and for those that are in low paid work to progress to higher paid, more meaningful employment when both the unemployed people and the people in work are operating within a labour market where there's likely to be a significant oversupply. So in this context... The vulnerability of many of our households uh, to any reduction in income is a real is a real cause for concern, and that's where we step in. So, as Mike has touched on, a lot of what we've been doing has been working closely with businesses to get on the front foot of that as far as possible. So, if we think staff are going to be made redundant, we can work with them. We're working with support organisations like the trade unions and the National Career Service, so we can provide those individuals with some real wraparound support. 
uh, and that will include kind of giving them presentation on how to access benefits, making sure they have access to funds for retraining, trying to help them upskill so they can take some of the uh, jobs within their own companies to minimise the job loss overall, uh, giving support for people around employability, so people who might not have had done interview work, CV work for you know years and years and years, and also working where we can to give those people exclusive interview opportunities within within the district. So access to those workforces is really key. Uh, you might already be aware of some European programmes we run within communities. So community-led local development is one that Mike runs. And that's all about within our most deprived wards, making sure that we're supporting community organisations to be able to provide uh, the support that our most vulnerable residents need to enable them to uh, to support their economic inclusion. And I, I think you'll... I did want to touch on housing a bit because that it's not covered on the slides and I'm conscious you might touch it on some of your other agendas, but just very quickly because it sits within our service. We're also doing lots of work uh, to make sure we continue to deliver and promote key energy and homeowner support schemes. So you'll be well aware, I think, of the Fuel Poverty Fund, the Warm Homes Fund, making sure people have warm, home, dry, healthy homes. And we also provide the Money Smart Service, which gives people... a uh, debt advice and money about maximising the household income. Do lots of work to improve standards for people in the private rented sector, uh, be that heating improvements. We do lots of work with uh, landlords. So we have an accredited landlord scheme to make sure landlords are providing uh, their tenants with the, with the support and quality of housing that they deserve. And that we also do lots of work proactively enforcement work in priority neighbourhoods. So we've done that in College Grove and Primrose Hill, and we're just about to do that now in Abrig and Bellevue. And just to give you an idea of the scale of work that we then do in those communities, in Primrose Hill, where we've been really proactive recently, we've had to inspect uh, 215 properties and we've uh, in issued landlords with over 200 schedules of works and legal notices to make sure that they're bringing those houses up to the right standard. There's also a significant commitment from the council to increase the affordable housing supply across the district. So we've been releasing for some time, we've been looking at how we can uh, release council land uh, to registered providers to enable new units to be delivered. And we've been doing everything we can as a council to influence what those new units look like. So that's through the planning process and through the tendering of our own uh, estate. And I know Nicola Esmond's taken on a piece of work specifically leading on uh, that specialist and disabled uh, housing needs and how we can support that as a service. And we're also taking forward a couple of flagship schemes in partnership with WDH, one down at Chantry House that people hopefully know in the centre of Wakefield and one in Castleford. Interestingly, for the one at Chantry House, I'll look in and spoke to WDH about key worker accommodation, which I'm sure some of you will be interested in and how we make sure we uh, provide shared ownership properties to support uh, our key workers across the health service to access uh, affordable units in our district. And then there's lots and lots going on in terms of master planning, uh, both in our city centre and our priority town centres, which at the moment are Nottingley, Pontefract and Castleford. So as part of those master plans, it's about how can we design healthy, inclusive places. So it's about making sure residents have services they need on the doorsteps. They have access to public open spaces to enjoy and have the right mix of residential, business and leisure uh, spaces. They enable that so we can capitalise on the assets they've got and existing community ties within those areas. And in fact, I've got a discussion tomorrow with Dr Earnshaw about how we can work together to achieve that in Castleford. Uh, so again, master plans is a huge subject in its own right, but be more than willing to come back and discuss that. And then the final slide is just a few examples because really we wanted to open it up to yourselves to see where you think there might be opportunities for collaboration. But we've picked up a few examples where we think there might be uh, merit in further discussion. So one would be potentially be around that support to both homeowners and people in, in the private rented sector around cross referrals, making sure people are aware of that support we can offer uh, to individuals, both with support with everything from support with mortgage payments uh, to support with uh, energy efficiency measures. We also thought there could be something uh, around um, innovation. People, you might be 
well aware that Wakefield's kind of quite low when it comes to research and innovation, largely because of us not having a university. But I'm sure there's you know pockets of fantastic practice within the health sector, and we could uh, you know help kind of translate that into uh, economic opportunities for for those innovators. Uh, and then equally, I know there's lots the health sector does in terms of social prescribing on skills and employment, question are we doing enough in terms of supporting people towards self-employment and cross-referring to, to some of our schemes. Uh, and then anything, as I say, anything else that you think would be useful that we're not picking up on, we probably, I think there's a, a lot, lot more that we could do and we value your ideas uh, in terms of what specifically that might be. So thank you everyone for listening to that very quick canter through what was, a, I know, quite a lot of information to take in on the spot. Thank you, Claire and Mike. Um, excellent presentation. There are lots of information, some worrying statistics. I'm sure that's going to stimulate some debate. So um, I will open it up. Anna. Oh, yeah, thanks. That was a absolutely brilliant presentation i think it it's indicative of where we're at our health and well-being board that um you know a couple of years ago uh, a lot of the stuff we did was very health and social care focused and i think we've really broadened that remit now um rightly so and and everything you've talked about is just so relevant to the health and well-being agenda um, in terms of research and innovation, um, that's a, a despite the pressures of covid we're really trying to do more uh, more on that um and i'm going to bring bring a paper to the health and wellbeing board um the next health and wellbeing board um about some of the things particularly working with Ms. George who appointed um someone to do a research chair post um and also um Shane Mullen and my team has taken on a bit of a research role. So just to sort of just a bit of an early flag with with this board that um uh, one of the things I've, we've wanted to do for ages and ages is something like the Born in Bradford work programme, um, where every single child in Wakefield and every single family would be signed up to kind of take part in this fantastic research programme, which pulls together um, multi-agency data with consent to kind of really get a deep understanding, um, not just of health and social care, but of kind of broader impacts. Um, and we're we're sort of, it's, it's early days and we need to get the right governance and we need An early uh, spoiler alert um that this that this is something that we're we're starting to progress um and and i think you know i think this board would be very supportive of that and this board would be the place where that would kind of own that that piece of work um so i will be kind of liaising with people out outside of the board but just to say that that's one one thing that's on the on the cards um and hopefully one of many and i think it is well recognized that wakefield has been a bit um I'm going to turn my camera off, actually, because I think, I've, yeah, Wakefield has been a bit behind the curve on that, and we are trying really hard to, 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 to sort that out. Thank you very much, Anna, and I welcome your comments about, you know, this is a new era for Wakefield. We're, we're, we're talking about the broader, wider determinants of health, the economy, healthy economy, healthy population. And sometimes I think we should be called the Wellbeing and Health Board because well-being leads to health. Um, so um, we've had that discussion before, Anna, and, and you know, a great paper there, but some worrying statistics. Esther. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was a really good presentation, and I was really struck by um, some of the facts, particularly the, the one in three people are furloughed, which I, I, that, I was quite astounded by it being so high. And I was just wondering, you know, if, if people are, are on furlough uh, from businesses, they're obviously that little bit more out of touch, but actually that little bit more vulnerable in terms of their health and well-being. And I'm just wondering if there's anything the board could do to support you and businesses in making sure that people, uh, those people on furlough, low know where to go for help or that support businesses in providing some of that advice and support and, and signposting i'm just wondering if there's something more we can do to help with that can i come in on that claire yeah go on yeah uh, that would be that would be welcomed um at the moment we've been working with a lot of uh, external parties and consultants who during this time have been offering the time free of charge uh, to su support businesses so that they can consider their their staff that are that are furloughed, uh, and we've been offering webinars and, and different tips and tricks of what businesses can do to support the staff. But again, we would welcome um, anybody who could could support us and deliver uh, some information sessions. Um, we'll we'll arrange it and give you access to those businesses and get the bums on the seats. So we'd we'd happily funnel that information and share that to our businesses. That would be welcome. I'm, I'm sure that's something we could work together on as a board. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, Councillor Forster.
Richard, are you on mute? All right, that's better. Um, thank you, Chair. Just to pass a comment on your excellent presentation, but I just need, I, I've got to have it recorded at the board, that the team that has backed up uh, Mike um, and Claire, the, the, the comments that I've had back have been first class. The businesses could not have praised that team anymore. And some of the uh, challenging things they've had to deal with to ensure, I, I think it brought up a lot of problems uh, that the, the business owners weren't aware of. Mm. Uh, they've gone to the nth degree to make sure businesses were supported, got the grants, and also resolved a number of problems into the bargain. So uh, from my point of view, just a massive well done to Claire, Mike, and their teams. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Just in terms of uh, businesses, presumably there's a lot of networking between these businesses, cross referrals, assisting each other locally. Um, I get the feeling the population are really keen to support local businesses and network. Well, certainly I found that out because I was getting calls at the weekend to say, uh, you've been helping this business, can you actually say where we can go for this? Can you go for that? And, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I was finding as well, that um, the team supported us as local councillors, so we were able to say, look, you need to go onto this website, you need to do this, and then if you've got a problem. But definitely the networking, um, I think it's brought the best out in some of the businesses. They haven't just kept the information to themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, the pubs and clubs and places like that, um, they've actually been supporting the smaller corner shops and passing information. So, yeah, I think it's probably brought the best out in a lot of people that we weren't I, expecting. I would 100% agree with that. And, I mean, even cross-boundary as well, uh, we've had businesses based in Sheffield and some of my older contacts that have read some of our posts and said, look, I'll do you some free webinars, Mike, to support your, your businesses on certain specific subjects, whether that be, you know, employment law or contracting. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic and has really brought the, uh, the best out of, uh, out of people. And I think as well as businesses supporting each other, it's just people suddenly have a real affinity to the local place since all of this has happened, you know, when they think about the local community, because those messages were so clear at the height of the lockdown. And I think we've absolutely seen that since that people, when people are going to spend a pound, if they live in Wakefield, they think, I'd rather give this pound to a Wakefield business than mm. elsewhere. So hopefully that loyalty uh, to community and place continues, because that's real positive. Okay. Yep. Thanks again. Thanks, Thank Richard. You, yeah, I've just got a comment from Anna in the chat box worth pointing out that a great job Claire's team has done on adult skills. And obviously, uh, that's been a big turnaround, significant influencer on uh, improvement of health. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Support that. that's great news. So I'm going to bring Sean in. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Claire and Mike. That was really helpful. And um, that last slide, Claire, where you prompted some questions about what opportunities there are, I think, is, is a really important one. Just just before you come in on, on this uh, meeting, we were referencing um, making every contact count with the public. And I think, for example, where um, many organisations come into contact with people who have mental health issues or emerging mental health issues, and that might be employment related, um, just making sure that we've got information, whether that's Turning Point or SWIFT or any other provider of mental health services, on what information there is um, that people can access. For example, you mentioned information on business startups, business startup schemes. So we have that to hand. Mm -hmm. So if, if redundancy or the prospect of redundancy is um, a causative factor of um, people's uh, mental ill health, then we've got some practical support that we can provide, not just in terms of the uh, health therapy, but the, the practical societal, societal information that we can uh, bring into the discussions as well. Yeah, absolutely. We can work on the pulling, it's almost a menu, isn't it, together? Mm. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks for that comment, Sean. And, uh, just want to thank Claire and Mike um, once again. Really detailed, really interesting presentation. Very important, particularly around well-being of our population in Wakefield. And continue the good work. And obviously, if we can help further, we'd like to see you back. Oh, we'd so. love to be back. Yeah, you, yeah. Well, we never get such fantastic feedback as this. <laughs> Good, my dear. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Really important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.
Thank you. So um, we'll move on to agenda item 8C, creating and sustaining healthier communities in the context of COVID. Another very important presentation here. Last year, we did agree um, to establish a new healthier communities group to sit under our health and wellbeing board. And I think there's been some pause of that during COVID. However, I think today you're going to hear some important aspects around physical activity and climate change. Again, really important in the wider determinants of health and well-being, close to my heart. And um, I look forward to hearing this presentation. So I'm going to introduce John Wilcox and Gerald McCormack to present. So, gentlemen, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, over to you. Have we got them on the call? Yes, hello, sorry about that. We just oh. ha have a type because Gerard unfortunately can't hear anything you're saying, so he's just trying to rejoin. Uh, I see. Are, so you, are, are you happy to start, John, or would you wish yes. to wait? Yeah, as I say, we, luckily I've, I've got the first few slides and then Gerard comes in, so hopefully okay. by the time I've finished this. So, as I say, my name is John Wilcox and I'm a health improvement team leader in the uh, Healthy Places team. Uh, within the health improvement, which sits s s between regeneration and public health in a sort of uh, area, you know, working between those two areas. Uh, Gerard, uh, who's trying to, is an environmental health team leader in the environmental health team. So uh, I think if we just go to the first slide, please. Uh, Basically, I think as a year ago, uh, Amy Sharp, I believe, came and spoke to you about the work of the sustainable group. And I think Liz Blenkinsop has been as well. And so this is just a brief update on that, that since that time, the group you mentioned has met and it's set and worked together with the parts to clarify its aims. And the aims it's set is to help with the creation and the development of healthy and sustainable communities to protect and improve the health and well-being of all Wakefield District residents while narrowing health inequalities. And the work's been split into three themes, and these themes are people, which are basically linking to uh, ensuring people have the skills to create healthy communities, practice, which is more about organisations and businesses to ensure that they have the policies and systems in place to create healthy communities. And then we have place, which is what the real focus of today's uh, presentation is going to be, which is making sure that actually we have healthy places and places that actually support people to live a healthy lifestyle and be healthy. All these are based on the World Health Organization's Healthy Cities Phase 7 aims and which in turn are based on the World Health Organization's Sustainable Development Goals. So it's all based on the uh, from the World Health Organization. So if we just switch to the next slide, please. So then if we go to COVID-19, what we've found is that COVID-19, as we all are aware, have, has, has had great many impacts. Some of these a negative, some are positive. I mean, the, the key negative impacts are generally health impacts that we're all aware of, illnesses, hospital admissions, deaths, and these have been felt particularly worse in areas of the highest deprivation. I think there was some research that showed that in the poorest decile, you were twice as likely to die or have seriously complications uh, of COVID-19 than in the richest decile in England. So, it is a real impact, but there's also impacts of the virus on uh, wider things. For example, how we travel, where we travel, our environment, the air quality and noise pollution, how we work, rest and play, our physical and mental well-being, uh, stress and anxiety, how we access services and what services we active, and also what legislation the government is proposing and how it's implemented. All these things have happened as a result of COVID-19, but also as a result of the actual measures put in place to actually deal with the virus, such as lockdown. So it's become quite a thing. And what we've found and what the evidence seems to show is that, and this is quite a generalisation, but it's 
again, it's, it has a truth behind it, is that the negative impacts tend to have the biggest negative impact on the poorest members of society, while the positive impacts tend to have the least effect on the poorest members of society. Well, on the richer members of society, the negative impacts tend to be a little less, while the positive impacts tend to have a greater effect. Uh, and I say that's something of a generalisation, but it still actually has that impact. So Gerard was going to speak about the uh, impacts in more detail. So I should just see if he's available and can speak to us. So are you there? No, he isn't. So I'm, I, I, shall, I shall make this a one-man show. I apologise if this is a little uh, vague because I say this is the thing, but basically one of the key impacts is travel. Uh, and what we've seen is COVID-19, and especially lockdown, has had a big effect on how we travel. We are travelling less and travelling differently. When lockdown was first imposed, there were far fewer motor vehicles on the road, massive fall in the use of public transport, and this created negative and positive impacts, both threats and opportunities. We had less congestion in our towns and cities, so that meant faster travel times, if you were travelling around, uh, better air quality, massive reductions in uh, nitrogen dioxide and particles in the air, less noise, less climate change, CO2 emissions, and safer roads, which all encouraged people to actually walk and cycle more. There was also threats, of course, which is the, the big obvious one, is a massive threat to the actual economy and the health and well-being of people. As lockdown eased, we saw a gradual increase in the number of cars on the road, and they've almost returned back to normal levels, but not quite. But there's still a significant decrease in public transport. So that creates threats. Is what does it actually mean for the long-term future of the public transport sector? It may be irreparably damaged, and the poorest are most likely to be harmed by this. We also have the fact that there are more private cars on the road, so that equals poor air quality, noise, congestion, back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, and so these are issues, but also the fact we've got the opportunity that it may promote greater use of more active forms of travel. Can I have the next slide, please? There's also wider environmental impact. So we've seen all the travel impacts which we mentioned before, and travel is one of the biggest causes of environmental issues, such as air pollution, noise, climate change. But there's also other threats. For example, we've seen in our parks increased litter, uh, increased antisocial behaviour, which impact on the environment. There's also uh, evidence that shows that possibly we're now starting to look at more environmentally friendly ways of living, you know, travelling, staying more local and how can we actually ensure, use this as an opportunity to ensure these positive things actually remain and we make the most of them. And when COVID's gone, we actually still keep these opportunities to actually create a greener and more pleasant environment. Go the next slide, please. Uh, the other thing it's impacted on is how we work, rest and play. So if we look at work, uh, one of the big things what we all notice is when lots more people are working from home. But it's not everyone that's working from home. It tends to be the slightly more well-off office workers who work from home, while the actual poorer members of our society often actually uh, have to work, either have to go into work, for example, people working in shops, cleaners, you can't, you know, if you're a cleaner or a shop assistant, you can't work from home. So the result is many of our poorest, lowest paid workers are actually having to go into work or if they can't go into work, rather than working from home, they're seeing their jobs become insecure, possibly, you know, furloughed or made redundant. So again, we're seeing the fact that there are different impacts depending on your income and economic status. What is also thing that's something is that although we make this generalisation that it tends to be richer, more wealthy people who are working from home, there are also a number of poorer people and people in more deprived areas who are working from home as well. And generally, their homes tend to be smaller, less suited to working from home, uh, more overcrowding. Uh, they often can't afford the electricity and heating bills that working from home adds to their costs. So there are impacts of that as well. There's also the fact that uh, 
this creates threats and opportunities. So there's an opportunity that working from home improves people's work-life balance, and we can invite new ways of working for people who have to go into work. However, there's also threats that you see in job insecurity for people and low-paid workers having to actually go and maybe not be able to work from home. Can we have the next slide, please? Then we've got how we rest and play or really our lifestyle. And what we've seen is this has created very changes to an impact on how we actually live our lives and how this impacts on our health and well-being. Our team is the health improvement team, the team that I work for. And one of our key things is actually supporting people to live a healthy lifestyle. How do we make health part of it in people's everyday life? And we've seen a great change because what COVID has done is helped or resulted in people having to change their habits. It's forced people into change their habits. So, for example, because people were allowed one episode of daily exercise, people almost felt obliged to take it. And we've seen actually physical activity levels in some areas increase because people felt obliged to take physical activity because it's the only actual episode they had. We also have seen opportunities to increase uh, and prioritise health because of the Prime Minister saying that uh, obesity had an impact on his experience of COVID-19. And as a result, there was the launch of the Better Health campaign, which has given lots of new resources for promoting a healthy lifestyle. However, there's also been threats to lifestyle. For example, gyms, swimming pools have been closed during lockdown, and they're still not open and running at full capacity. People are still slightly dubious about, as it were, going to gyms and going to swim and doing the types of activity and leisure activities, such as theatres and pubs and uh, all the things they used to do before in restaurants. You know, they're still, I think, people are feel slightly uneasy about using them and threatened. So there's opportunities and threats again in how we work, rest and play. Can we have the next slide, please? The other thing, this thing is the services we access. For example, uh, we've got threats because lots of services are just not or were not as accessible. There's barriers to actually people going in and having face-to-face -face contact. Also, some services have then worked in a different way and become remote, but still we have barriers is that many of our poorest members of society maybe don't have the internet data access and equipment to actually access remote services. And even when services run face to face, maybe they run limited hours or from a different location, meaning that our poorest members often suffer public transport issues or the fact that they have to go into work and can't work from home or can't work flexibly. So we're actually stuck with the fact that they can still not access services as well. Can I have the next slide, please? And finally, on the impacts, we have legislation. And what we've seen is the government actually, as a result of COVID, using COVID-19 as a catalyst for lots of new legislation, examples of which are the uh, key one, planning for the future, which is a complete revision of the planning system that in the white paper guidance uses COVID-19 as an actual catalyst for that, saying that it's one of the drivers of needing to re reinvigorate the system to actually try and reinvigorate the economy. Uh, and this creates, all, there are quite a few new bills. There are temporary bills such as the Emergency Active Travel Bill, which is trying to get people using active travel more to reduce, uh, to try and keep the uh, active travel benefits of traffic reduced on the roads. And then there are permanent bills such as the Environment Bill and the Planning Bill I mentioned before. These bills, I think, offer threats and opportunities. There's an opportunity for reform and to do things better. But there's also a fact that COVID may result in these bills being rushed through and not be properly, properly scrutinised. So there's a threat there as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So quickly, what are we doing as a council and wider services to actually look at these impacts? And I've talked about some of the impacts, but obviously not talked about all of them. So we've got one, promoting active travel. The council are working with Wicker and the government to access the Emergency Active Travel Fund, creating new temporary, experimental and permanent cycle lanes. Uh, we've also got cycle training because you can create all the cycle lanes in the world, but if people aren't confident to cycle on the roads, they won't do it. So we're actually implementing uh, cycle training so that basically workers in Wakefield can get one-to-one -one cycle training with a trainer to cycle to teach them how to cycle to work. There's also community cycle sessions. We've also got 
sessions at schools to actually encourage children to cycle and build the confidence to cycle safely. Uh, there's also measures to encourage walking. So the idea is that we're actually creating the infrastructure to allow people to use public transport, I mean, to use active travel, but actually also encouraging them to do it. There's also promoting the green assets of the local area, encouraging people to take leisure on their doorstep through the, I don't know if people have seen the Doorsteps Discoveries campaign, which was a magazine about the local green assets and what you can do that went round every uh, household in the district. Where there's also ensuring the green assets are actually of well-maintained and of a high quality. And the green, uh, sorry, the street scene team are out there doing litter picks and making sure that play areas and local green environments are actually high quality for people who don't have, don't have gardens. There's also the work that the workplace health team is doing, actually working with employers to not just focus on helping employers keep their workers safe from COVID-19, but also to help them keep their workers, such as workers of the low paid type who have to go in to work, who actually to keep them free of stress and, to, you know, to help with their mental well-being. So you've got workers who are having to work from home and so don't get social interaction. How do employers look after their mental well-being? Workers who may have to go into work and feel very worried and anxious about catching COVID-19. How do we look after their mental well-being? How do we help people stay active? So the uh, workplace health team are working with uh, those people. We've also got sharing knowledge where lots of local authorities are getting together in bodies such as the Healthy Places Community of Interest and Active Yorkshire to actually look at ways to actually maximise some of these uh, impacts of COVID-19, you know, grasp the opportunities and mitigate the threats is what we're trying to do. There's support for parents and to keep their children active and engaged through low cost ideas, such as some of you may have heard of the 50 Things campaign, which is currently running, which is ideally initially going to run under fires, but it's about giving parents the resources to actually keep their children entertained with low cost, no cost activities. There's also helping people stay, stay healthy through the regional and national schemes and campaigns, such as Better Health, which the government has just launched. Uh, there's consulting on new policies, such as the Planning for the Future bid and the Health Impact Assessment Guidance for England, where we need to actually, where as a council, we've been feeding in to make sure that we actually make sure these laws and these new legislations are fit for purpose and actually maximise opportunities without actually limiting what we can actually do. And then there's also helping the economic recovery. And what we've been doing is through the planning system, through health things, my team actually worked by providing comments on planning applications in order to stop health being an obstacle, make health a facilitator for development rather than an obstacle, obstacle to development. And the other thing we're doing is ensuring services are accessible to all through digital inclusion. Uh, and this has taken the form of a survey that's currently taking place of all major services where public health are actually wanting to ask services, how are they making their services accessible to all if people can't get to them in person, and how are they making sure that they ensure the most vulnerable have equal access? Could I have the final slide, please? So what we'd like to ask is to look at how we can, and you as a board can look at how we can grasp the opportunities and mitigate the threats presented by the current situation. And one thing we'd like is how can we actually work together to identify learning from the current situation, to limit the impact of the most vulnerable of the current crisis, but also to actually think of future crises. For example, we keep hearing about the threat of an imminent ch climate change crisis. It may not happen, but if it does, how do we make sure we use the learning from COVID-19 to ensure that the most vulnerable don't suffer from that? There may be other diseases there may be a financial crisis as a result of Brexit or, uh, or the, you know, COVID-19. How do we actually ensure that these possible future crises actually don't have a massive impact on our poorest people? Uh, the other thing we'd probably like you to look at is how do we agree is possibly as a district agreeing and communicating a shared vision for what an equitable, healthy and sustainable Wakefield actually looks like and what we want to see. Now we have the Healthy Wakefield Charter, which was created a few years ago, which sets out from a health improvement point of view, a view for the uh, district. But what we tend to find is when you're working with partners about creating a sustainable community and a healthy, sustainable community, one of the things they say is, well, what do you want to create? What do you want us to do? And 
if you ask 10 people, you tend to get 10 answers. So the idea is if we could, as a district, actually create a shared vision, a simple, easy shared vision for what a healthy, sustainable Wakefield looks like. The other one of the key things is also is that one thing that our team leads on is health impact assessment. And that's actually when any measure is put into place, it's looking at what the impacts on health and well-being of that measure will be in its broadest possible terms. And we've seen from COVID-19 that impacts are very, very complicated. So it's actually what we have is uh, looking at how we actually measure those. And so one thing we'd like to do is introduce health impact assessment for all key decisions, because that would ensure that health is considered all the lesser things we want to look at, but still important, are how we actually support all services, support people to lead a healthy lifestyle. How do all services promote physical activity, healthy diet and good work-life balance? And there's a few examples there, but I know I'm running short on time. And the other thing we'd like you to look at is possibly if you could think about how we can engage and consult and lobby at a local, regional, national level and national level to ensure that policies, when they come out like the new planning policy, new government policies, are actually policies that grasp opportunities but don't actually threaten to actually make sure policies are fit for purpose and they have to do the best possible job and making sure that local we actually engage and i think that's basically through the presentation i hope that made sense thank you very much john excellent presentation once again and um well done for seeing that through on your own um uh, I'm going to open it up for questions and comments at this point in time. Um, great to see opportunities and threats. I like the way you presented those and particularly again around the wider determinants of health and our responsibility uh, in terms of, you know, sustainable communities and a great place to live and work and all the things that we are trying to embed in our health and wellbeing vision. Um, any comments or questions for John or indeed I believe Jared is on the uh, the list of participants, so it may be that he can join and comment as well. Gemma, you've got your hand up. Apologies, Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? I think everybody, Beate. Thank you. Um, really, really good presentation. Thank you. I found that really insightful and, and just bringing together um, some of the learning. I'm really interested in what you've said about um, health impact assessment. So that, that bit about how do we make um, the impact on health central in the decisions we make about areas that might not immediately be seem connected. Um, so I, I think that's really good one to to think about, but but maybe just making sure that doesn't just become a bureaucratic exercise. So it feels like a burden. It's it's how do we make that um, something that's live in the discussion? But but very much support that. Thank you. Thank you, Beate. And I think throughout all the presentations to, to me today, it is about well-being and wider determinants of health. And our remit, not just to look at, you know, health in the truest and the sort of context of perhaps I do as a doctor, but, you know, there are so many other things that we need to be conscious of and how we build that. And it's a very complex picture. But, John, I think you've presented that very well and lots of food for thought. And we hope to hear you again in terms of, um, you know, this, this subject. So... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on now to our final agenda item uh, on this section. That's 8D, giving every child the best start in life and the impact of COVID on education and mental health support on return to school. So this area and priority is being led by the Children and Young People's Partnership uh, on behalf of the board. Um, and Beate is the link between the two boards. And I may ask Beate to comment before we introduce um, our presenter. Um, this has been a really challenging time for our young people, disruption from school and education, really important. It's caused lots of anxieties and our vulnerable um, young adults and children have been um, affected the worst. Um, I think today's presentation will highlight the impact of COVID on education, what we're doing to support those young people. 
So just before I introduce um, Andy Lancashire, who I believe is going to present this item, I'm going to ask Beata if you'd like to see anything first. Thank you, Adam. Um, I, I, I think obviously this has been absolutely central and um, to everything we've been doing. Um, the, the impact of children not being in school um, has been really significant, um, and, and, and I'm sure people will, will be looking at that in the presentation. But like the other presentations, I think it has absolutely created some opportunity the, this time and the way people have responded to challenges, both in terms of um, partnership working and, and the way people have, have worked together. Um, the, the, I think what we, will, what we will start to see with schools returning now um, for all children, and of course our most vulnerable children have been in, in school throughout, but I think we will start to learn a lot more around uh, around particularly what the impact on emotional well-being has been as children become more visible um, again in schools. So it's really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that both um, Andy and Sean are here to present on this. The emotional well-being is one of the, the key priorities and the key work strands for, um, for the Children and People's Partnership. So I think the presentation will reflect that too. Thank you very much, Beate. Um, so over to you, Andy, and um, supported by Sean as well. Andy, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Adam. Thanks, Beate. Uh, yes, my name's uh, Andy Lancashire. I'm the Service Director for Education and, and Inclusion. And obviously, I'll let Sean introduce himself. Um, I don't know whether you want to introduce yourself now, Sean, or when it comes to your little bit. I'll, I'll do it um, when I follow, follow on for you, Andy. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Sean. Okay, um, so as has been laid out, yeah, you know, the impact of COVID on, on settings and, and schools, obviously since late March has been a significant challenge, I think, to, to, to us all. As Beate said, um, schools never actually closed. They've remained open for designated year groups and our vulnerable uh, young people throughout. And I think it's worth stating that um, all of our schools remained open during that period we didn't have any any schools that uh, that, that were closed uh, other than when they formed sort of small bubbles at the initial start of the crisis but by the end of of of, of that first aspect of the of the covid lockdown uh, leading up to the summer holiday all of our schools were open um, we had uh, in excess of 11,000 young people out of a cohort of 53,000 back in school um, which um, I'm reliably informed by the DfE uh, was above the national uh, averages and significantly um, in terms of our regional colleagues was 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 above that as well. So we felt um, I think that in terms of the collective, the way that we work together, um, that, that had been relatively successful. Um, in in terms of challenges, I think that that we faced in that in that period, um, I think I think the first thing was was making sure that we had a, a rigorous and robust way of tracking our vulnerable young people. Um, and that was something that um, um, we worked very, very hard at across the safeguarding partnership um, and also led to um, if you like, an early adoption of Wakefield Families together in terms of its multi-agency integrated approach. And I think that has, has, has brought us great success. And I think probably meant that we were in a more advantageous places, place than perhaps some other, other local authorities. So this meant that, that we'd, we'd got teams working very closely with schools and academies around vulnerable young people. Clearly, part of that process at the same time around the challenges and Beate's touched on the I think the work the the, the concerns and they're still there around educational progress and attainment particularly for our disadvantaged vulnerable young people in terms of them not being in school for a for a significant period um, one of those challenges was around remote learning and I think I don't think we've um I don't think we're there yet. I think that's still a significant challenge nationally, educationally for, for the sector, uh, and one that I think will continue to develop. Part of that was the digital laptop scheme, which we, we worked hard to make sure that our year 10 pupils, now disadvantaged students, got access to that. Um, but it's still a continuing, I think the sort of digital poverty is still a continuing aspect of the work that we've got. The other piece of work that was very joined up across the, across the district was around um, free school meals. 
and ensuring that that uh, again our vulnerable young people had access to to decent decent food um and I, and again there was a lot of joint working around that with our community hubs with with other colleagues in the voluntary sector as well um and we were uh, and I, interestingly within the first few weeks of that crisis um we'd got nearly we'd got something like high 90 percent take up of free school meals of children that weren't in school at the time so again that system worked really really well uh, 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 moved moved us forward, so um, I think that's that, that they've been su- significant successes in what was uh, clearly a very challenging time. Uh, going back to Wakefield families together as well, I think the, the, the other part of the work that we did was that it was part of our regular communications to schools, so uh, settings and academies. So we've got a daily update that goes out, and that's been very much a vehicle by which we've been able to progress. Um, the locality working, that the, the, the multi-agency approach um, to schools and also signpost them into um, um, a structure that we've turned team around the school. And this, again, um, we've, is in its um, early phases after a, a very successful pilot in the, in the summer term. Again, this is, this is paying dividends now in which vulnerable young people are being supported holistically in, in regular meetings that are multi-agency. And, and, and we think that's going to bring us significant success um, uh, across, across the piece. So the regular communications, I think, into schools also enables us to 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 have that degree of communication with school leaders that, that was that was quite supportive. Um, other challenges that, that that we thought were going to be major challenges that actually haven't uh, around school transport, both for our SEND young people and for general school transport, public transport, that seems to be. Um, running okay at the moment. So in terms of, of where we are now in terms of the current scenario with schools, now I'll move on to some of the things we've done around uh, emotional well-being in a minute. Um, as you'll know, from, from the 7th of September, schools reopened to all year groups. Um, and that's meant that our average attendance, again, bearing in mind a cohort of 53,000, has varied between, on a daily basis, is between 88% to 90%. Um, in normal circumstances, we would we would expect it to be above 96% is, is the measure where we would want to be. How that breaks down in terms of phases, we've got around 90% of our young people in primary school, 84% in secondary, a bit of variability about the, the secondary percentage at the moment, because as, uh, as you'll know, we've got some year group bubbles who are having to self-isolate so they're sort of significant numbers of, of young people 50 100 that type of figure um depending on a couple of cases that we've had um secondary sorry uh, special schools and proves are around the 75 to 78 percent mark recently so that's that's been a a, a general improvement as 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 uh, again time has gone on and i think is a good indicator of how that multi-agency working with um, with those vulnerable young people um, is starting to have have an impact. So in terms of um, emotional well-being, and, and Sean's going to pick up on some some more of the detailed work that's been happening. Um, we've our, our educational psychologists have been heavily involved in working with other key partners in providing support into schools. So clearly, one of the one of the things that they'll provide support around has been loss and bereavement, and again, sometimes the the, the guilt that young people can feel around around COVID, and and potentially were they the sort of asymptomatic asymptomatic carriers of something that's then affected older relatives in their family. So the EPs have worked very closely with schools across this period. They've produced. Um, uh, a loss and bereavement guide, which again gives schools um, those the, the the type of resources that they need. Again, we we flag those up consistently in the communications to schools and make it really clear clear where we can find them and refer to them in the in the network meetings that we have with head teachers and school leaders. In addition to that, um, the we've we've the Yorkshire and Humber um, Mental Health Clinical Network have also produced um, a really excellent document um, in terms of resources that are available to schools, um, and that again is 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 sat as a as a link, a consistent link on all the communications I go to schools it, that I send out to schools every day. So head teachers know where they can find it where they can dip into different aspects of that work as, as they need it. Um, and then our EP service have also produced a recovery curriculum document. Um, 
which is excellent and uh, and again is, is is details the support if you like that is there for schools and the way in which it's it's organized um it talks about the sort of key levers um that we have with with young people in terms of their return to school and around relationships um as the first one community being another a transparent curriculum the work around metacognition that you'll be familiar with and 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 the other thing that's important with young people, whether in this sort of, the, as we know, this lockdown challenging COVID situation, which will be, you know, completely unique to them, is the space for them to be able to to rediscover their selves and find their voices. And that's that's what we mean by this recovery curriculum, where, whereby schools um, adapt really their their approaches uh, and, and how they work. So again, within that document, there's there's a, a wealth of, of information for schools to access. And we've also made it sort of um, very clear in there, the local service offer that we've got um, around the work that we do with emotional well-being and mental health. Um, and clearly, this involves our EP service, it includes Future in Mind, uh, and the work that they do, our colleagues in public health, um, as well in terms of the risk and resilience um, website and the documentation there. I'm going to um, pause at that point and if there are any questions around that aspect before I hand over to 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 Sean if that's okay. Thank you very much Andy. Um, any questions? Richard? Thanks Chair. Um, I just think it's worth following on the point that Andy raised about the teams working together without looking at the positive things that's come out of COVID. Uh, for me, at on as chair of governors of quite a large primary school, and also uh, the school where um, my wife works at, they see uh, a much more bonding of the teams around the school that probably we've ever seen before. Uh, when we first started looking at this new approach, we started to see that there was still a bit of a silo mentality, and, and in a perverse way, the COVID crisis has actually brought the teams to work closer together. And from the comments that I receive on a regular basis, is it's just a natural thing. If they've got a problem, they know what to ring, they've got the confidence that they will ring and develop. And, and this working relationship that's developed throughout this, uh, over the last six months while we've been dealing with COVID, and the uh, schools that have been contacting the parents, they've discovered things. Uh, on a regular basis, they've had to bring in different partners to support that family at a much earlier stage that probably they wouldn't have done in the past. So I think in a, in a strange way, but in a very, very positive way, uh, it's congratulations to all the partners that are uh, around the family, that are around the children, that during this time, we see some real, real positive strides forward to uh, partnership working ineffectively to be a team around the schools we planned. Yeah, Andy, do you want to come back on that? Just, you know, I would agree, Richard. I think I think it's been, um, I think the challenge of the situation has is, is, is enabled us to provide solutions, hasn't it? And I think that's, yeah. that's given a real kickstart to that multi-agency integrated approach. And I think what's, what's absolutely fantastic now is you can go into a room of, of people across various services and they know each other and and they have that relationship um, which I think enables them people across our key partners across the CCG, NHS, Early Help, Children's Social Care, the, the teams in education inclusion and the police and so on and so forth. People know each other at a local level and the schools know who they are as well and I think that that will continue to make, a, that will only get better I think and uh, because of the structures that we've got. And I think that will start to make a significant incremental difference, I think, over a period of time, notwithstanding, as we've said, you know, the real sort of educational challenges that we've got in the fact that we've had, you know, numbers of young people not in day to day learning um, and the impact that that's had on them. But I think we're in a we're in a, a strong place in a challenging situation, if that if, if that makes sense. I totally agree with you, Andy. I mean, Chair, if you just comment as well, uh, I think the the work that the schools have done uh, and the teachers and the teaching assistant actually keeping that regular weekly and in some cases day-to-day contacts and in some cases going out and visiting the homes and linking in with early health mm -hmm. has totally been underestimated. 
Mm. But I, I, say, I so echo what Andy's just said about when you go into a meeting, uh, there's almost everybody knows one another, which in a way that, that is fantastic, which you'd never have imagined six months ago we'd be in this position. So, yeah, well done. Yeah, I think, Richard, that just echoes what we're seeing throughout COVID, partnership work in organisations, working together, some networking yeah. there, and, you know, for the better and good. So, um, you know, I absolutely echo that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I shall hand over to Sean then, I think, for his, for his slide, if that's okay. Yeah, could, could you just hold the slide on the previous one before we come on to this uh, that's all right, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, thanks very much. I'll just let you know um, when to come on to that. So um, I, I introduced myself at the start of the meeting and I, I, I'm strand lead for the um, emotional health and mental well-being strand accountable to the uh, Children and Young People's Partnership Board. And um, I'm, I feel very fortunate to be in my job fundamentally, but um, I, I would genuinely say one of the most energising aspects of it is, is the strand lead role. Um, and to illustrate that, um, I think, I can't remember which board it was, June or July, um, we had a young person who gave his experience of accessing child and adolescent mental health services, um, what could be improved, and he'd also undertaken a, a survey amongst his peers about their experiences during lockdown and how they felt. So we, we get real-time feedback and that really helps energise and inform the work that we do as partners under the auspices of the, of the board. And um, as Andy has described, the, the Wakefield Families Together brand uh, has also really taken off and it. I, I see it as truly transformational in that it brings the partners together uh, to work in a different way um, who, are, who are part of the Wakefield Families Together um, group. But also it means that we've got a, a an anchor within which we can link into other important um, aspects of support for children and young people, particularly, for example, through the primary care networks who've um, presented at the uh, Integrated Care Partnership Board recently, the 16 to 25 uh, mental health support. So the, the links are clearly being made, which, which has been emphasised. But um, what's important is the outcome outcomes for children and young people. and. Um, uh, the team around the schools uh, initiative um, was in in planning train pre-COVID and during COVID, in fact, it was the 26th of June, we had a, a workshop via this team's methodology and it, it was really energising. So there was head teachers, teachers, uh, practitioners from social and health care. And um, we, we asked also quite challenging questions about how we would take this forward, what needed to change, how we would work together. And that's really moved forward now in terms of the um, a pilots we're undertaking in a number of schools. Um, so we'll hopefully learn from that as we roll that out across the whole district. So um, in, in terms of emotional health, uh, mental, emotional wellbeing, mental health support, um, the, the Strand has focused on that Wakefield uh, team around the school. Um, but it's also made sure that we get the, the base right in terms of the, the child and adolescent mental health service itself. So we've seen um, significant reductions in waiting times, both for assessment and treatment, and we need to improve on that and go further. But that, that's visible now in terms of the, the improvements that have been made. Uh, and also the Future in Mind services, uh, historically, with that terms been used to describe um, services like Cooth, Young Lives in Wakefield, come together really to, to act more coherently in terms of improving outcomes for children and young people. So just to illustrate briefly the, um, um, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service in the context of teams around the school, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, thank you. So th this slide tries to show how that multidisciplinary team consultation will then ensure that a, a young person gets into the right service at the right time to meet their needs and improve and make sure their outcomes are, are good. Um, so you can see this, um, just to illustrate the school pathway, the targeted in intervention and the non-targeted interventions, and then what happens in terms of how um, we support young people in those contexts and within each box there's a range of offers that we can we can make to young people to, to, to match their needs 
Uh, and recently we've been working, um, for example, uh, with Wakefield Trinity on Home Goals, which is a six-week six program um, of group work open to secondary age young people focusing on mental well-being. So we're not just working within, if you like, the traditional service boundaries and making sure we're making those links with local local groups and the wider multidisciplinary team. And hopefully that uh, pathway you can see there give, gives some illustration of the simplicity that we're trying to drive through this so everybody understands uh, the routes through which children and people will go to to receive support and, and enable them to move forward. So um, there's still still a way to go, and we're we're determined to get there. But under under the leadership of Beate and, and the and the board, I think we've made huge progress. And, and as I said at the outset, the the energy and enthusiasm is is palpable. And um, as children and young, and young people come back to schools and colleges um, now. Um, and, and as Beate said at the outset, the, the visible manifestation of their emotional um, well-being will we'll get, I'm sure we'll see increases in referrals to our services, uh, but we need to make sure we're geared, geared up for that. And I think through Wakefield Families Together, that, that creates a great opportunity to, to make sure we can handle that demand appropriately. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, um brilliant piece of work and um, something that's really close to my heart again when I, when I sit in my general practice and I see young people um, with more anxiety, more fears for the future, social isolation, again, missing their friends and, you know, certainly things like cooth.com, which I signpost to, is, has been really invaluable. And it's great to see this sort of cross-system working and partnership work and, in fact, that's what we're asked to discuss, how partners can support the work going forward and obviously note the presentation. So, um, can I open it up, please, to um, uh, participants to comment and perhaps ask some questions? Beate, at this point, do you want to come back in again? I think... Uh... Um, just say thank you to, to Andy and Sean, and I think it's just a testament to the way this is progressing. We're, we're, having, we're, we're talking from different organisations' perspective, but actually we're absolutely all um, uh, uh, signed up to, to really working together. I think what Sean was saying about managing the demand so the um what what wakefield family is together is trying to do making sure that we really really bottom out who's the best person to respond so that we stop that historic issue we 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 had when we were i suppose sort of two years ago when the when the, when when our inspection reflected the fact that was System. The only thing they could do was refer to social care or refer to um, to CAMS Direct rather than using all these different opportunities. And I think um, that's really that's that's really what we're trying to do now. That's not to say that um, uh, children and young people haven't been very significantly impacted. And I think everybody's. Um, uh, is reflecting that, and we don't really yet know what lasting impact might be on the um, on the most vulnerable children of missing um, very very significant parts of their education. So so it's one that I think we're in a good place to respond to um, as well as we possibly can. Um, but but um, the the fact is that um, that it is going to be. Um, probably a lot lasting part of those young people's lives. Thank you, Beata. And, and again, this um, priority is being led by the Children and Young People's Partnership Board, and we really welcome the report here. Um, it's great to hear what's happening in education, particularly with our young people and children. So thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, well, we we'll just asked to note the report, and um, I'm sure we welcome you back hearing how things progress um, uh, in this uh, field of work. And again, thank you very much, um, uh, Andy and Sean, for that presentation. Okay, so moving on, that completes the focus discussion. I think you'll all agree it's been. Um, Really great to hear some of the things that's happening in Wakefield, and I'm proud to be part of this system and 
you know, the issue around health and well-being and the fact that, you know, the wide determinants of health are being discussed at this board is, is paramount um, from my perspective. So I thank you for that. We don't know what's going to happen in the next few months, but uh, I think we're in a really strong position to um, keep things going on a positive level in, in, in the Wakefield system. Okay, so items for information. I've got item nine, connecting care executive minutes. I think we're just asked to accept those minutes and they are for noting. Um, Mel isn't here. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you want to comment on these minutes at all, if there's anything that we need to um, draw attention to, to board members. If not, we will just accept them. Um, nothing specific, Chair. I mean, happy to take any questions. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, we've still been able to get into some uh, meaty discussions during June and July, uh, notwithstanding lockdown. So um, um, happy to take any questions, but uh, otherwise it's just here for, for colleagues' information. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions for Andrew? Comments? Okay, if not, we'll accept those minutes. Thank, thank you very much. Um, any other business at this point? No, I'll take silence um, as that we can move forward. So um, just really want to thank everybody for what has been an excellent meeting. I've certainly enjoyed chairing this. Um, and um, I welcome hearing updates from all the people that have given uh, the presentations and led to some very insightful discussions at board level. Also like to thank um, the public for listening. And I hope the technology has worked well. It certainly appears to have served us well um, from this side. And I hope um, we will be using this platform again as we move forward into the November meeting. So well, it just remains for me to wish everybody well, um, keep safe and look forward to seeing you again in November. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.